Hey everybody, welcome to Online Worship with Alito United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are joining us from wherever you are this morning. Uh, if you're watching this on social media, we want to uh, ask you just to push like or share, and that way others can join us as well. Uh, now, will you turn your heart and your mind to God, and let's sing some together. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you You come come to that time of prayer, I invite you to remember a few people in particular who have asked for prayers from our church family. Continued prayers for Tom Seiler, Carrie Hester, Jeff Bond, for Janine Clark, Jan Hudler, Brad Dean, Kathy Vandercook, and prayer requests have come in for Janice Cole's niece, Camille, and Renee McCullough's father, Charles. So please lift them in your prayers this week. Will you go to God in prayer with me, please? Holy and gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you are a God of love and compassion. We thank you that you hear our prayers and that you love each one of us. And we lift our prayers to you, Lord. We should never come to you last. We should come to you first. But sometimes 
we get so wrapped up in ourselves and in our lives that we forget that you are waiting to hear from us. So remind us, remind us of your presence. We see it all around us in the beauty of nature and the love of family and friends. So remind us always that you are here and waiting for us to come to you, to come to you with our joys, with our concerns, and to reflect the love that you give us to everyone we meet. We pray for those that we've mentioned and all those in our church family who are struggling and having difficulties, those who are um, ill, those who are hospitalized, those who are struggling with loneliness or frustration or concerns about finances, all sorts of things, Lord, that um, confound us and frighten us. Remind us to come to you, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of mercy and forgiveness. Forgive us where we fail you, and thank you for a love that uh, continues to carry us through these days. These are challenging and scary times for so many, Lord, and we remember that you walk with us, and we praise you and just thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that we can continue to be the church, to share your love, to reach out in, in fellowship and, and compassion to other people around us, and remind us always that we are called to be the hands and feet, the heart of Christ to everyone we meet. We're challenged to do that. We know that you love us and walk with us. Lord, we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we share together the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear these words of scripture from Paul's letter to the Colossians, the second chapter, verses 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you for reading the scripture, Trudy. I want to talk to you today about living out your faith and what it means to live in truth. Uh, I'm not a fan of postmodernism. I believe in absolute truth, and I believe in the absolute truth of Jesus Christ. And I want to talk to you about that today, specifically from Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. Before we do, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that in spite of the nature of the presenter, that your will is done in the words that are spoken and empowered by the Holy Spirit and through the Holy Spirit. In the name of the risen Christ Jesus, all of God's church said, Amen. I want to talk to you today about false teaching. And I want to talk to you today about the, one of the biggest temptations that pastors have to please people. You have the truth. And then you have the marginal aspect of trying to please people at times. Paul writes a letter to the church at Colossae because they're experiencing a crisis of what we call false teaching. Now we knew as we've studied the Bible growing up, for those of you that have and for those of you that are new to the Bible, there are many cases that people tried to undermine the church, not only the church, but the gospel in itself. In fact, uh, even modern day times, there are, are pastors that uh, you talk about the divinity of Jesus and they want to change the subject. That's not Wesleyan. And in fact, the nature of the divinity of Jesus is indisputable in the Christian faith. Not from a postmodernistic perspective, but of, of a perspective of truth in itself with the foundational principles of Scripture. 
You know, the 14th chapter of John, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, not one of the ways and one of the truths and one of the lies. It's just not how it works. And so in the nature of this, Paul wants them to go back to the fertile nature of truth and says, stand in the truth. I say that to you today because in the nature of truth, sometimes we have to remind each other and remind ourselves that just because a popular nature is to make everyone happy, it doesn't mean it's correct or right or just or what we would call deontological in the eyes of God. So deontology is the study of the just and the good of the kingdom of God. That is to say, the things that are fair and unfair, that's a different level. I've always said this, but fair is where you go and you see a, a ribbon on a pig. That's the fair. Life in general is not fair. Don't we want everything to be fair? If you ever raise children and no one has, you may hear that's not fair. Truth is not about being fair. Truth is the just and the good in God's eyes. And Paul has to address people who have not only disputed it in multiple times in multiple churches, but Colossae is what we call more of humanity. And Paul is addressing that because in the nature of humanity itself, Paul says we have to stand in the truth. As you have accepted Christ, now look in your scripture. I know you have your Bible with you. And if you don't, pause this, go get it, open it up, Turn to Colossians chapter 2, go to verse 6. Because the first three words, as you therefore, using logic once again, the Greek logic in which Paul has been trained, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus as the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding with thanksgiving. I'm always amazed at the truth and the nature of bending truth. We have cliches about politicians that have bent truth into legalese, and I'm not going to recall those, but I remember years ago people asking questions, and because most politicians are lawyers, they were given no definitive answer. Or they were given an answer of partial action, therefore, that you would give in a courtroom. And I want to tell you a story about a pastor who was about to do a funeral that he did not want to do in a town where a man was absolutely ruthless. He cheated widows out of money. He stole land from people. If you did business with him, you knew that it was not going to turn out well and it would be to his advantage. And this man in particular is about to die and his brother comes to town. He calls on the pastor and says, look, my brother is not going to make it. I want you to do the service, but I'll tell you more about that. And the pastor says, okay, I'll, I'll do the service. The man passes the way and the, and the brother meets with him the next week in his office. And he says, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give your church $10 million out of my brother's estate. But what you're going to say about my brother... Regardless of your experience in this town or the people that knew him, is that he was a great guy. That he was a great man. You're going to say that. And I'll write you a check out of his estate for $10 million. The pastor pondered. And he prayed. And it came time for the memorial service of the brother. And his younger brother was sitting on the front pew with a smirk on his face. And the pastor got up and he read from the scripture and he gave a small homily, and then he looked out and he said, I want you to know that Bob was a great guy. A great guy. He was a great man. Compared to his brother Richard right over here. See, pastors sometimes are a little bit streetwise, as was this one. But if we don't root ourselves in the truth, as Paul says, in the midst of false teachers, in the midst of behaviors that shouldn't be acceptable, then we're not doing what is right and just and good. We're not seeking a what we call deontological solution to the problem. And the solution involves being immersed in integrity. And that integrity in the Pauline nature is that sometimes we will suffer for that integrity. I had a parent at a church one time that went to a coach in a high-end sports league, and he said, I need you to know 
Programming starts at our church at 6 o'clock. And I've asked you not to schedule practice on Wednesday to run late, and I want my child involved in the youth program. And he said, every night at 6 o'clock on Wednesday, we'll come to the other practices. But there are two things I need for my child. He needs to be in worship, and he needs to be in a small group with other people his age. I believe that's very important. The father called me one night, and a group of parents came over to he and his wife's front porch and lectured them on the nature of prioritizing their choices. Now, can you imagine? This man's trying to make sure that his son is learning the faith, and the parents want to know, and and I quote, if he's going to be a real team player, is he teaching his son what really matters? You see the struggles we have today? If God was standing before us or sitting on God's throne before us, or we were at literally at the feet of Christ, would our answers be any differently? Paul's asking the church of that. He said, you have false teachers. And basically what Paul is saying is a nice way of saying, don't don't let false teachers disrupt you. There's enough in the truth. As you have accepted Christ and accepted salvation, no. That in all things and in all ways you're immersed in Him and He in you. And that's enough. You're talking about churches where this in particular church, although being Gentile, the church at Colossae, Paul mentions three people who are what he uses in the term circumcised and says, hey, look, you know, I know you got some brothers among you, but don't lose who you are. Don't fall away. Don't fall into the easy route. Much like the illustration I gave where the pastor said, great guy, he was a great man, and then says, compared to his brother Richard up here. You see, we have to look at the relative context of things constantly, but in faith, the relative context is that you and I accept Jesus Christ. And in the 14th chapter, we're reminded of John in the 6th verse when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is not debatable. Jesus does not ever say, and by the way, as you learn more, as you become more broadened, as you want to please your friends, go ahead and sacrifice the teaching in which you have been given. I believe one of the biggest misnomers in the church of Jesus Christ today is that we have to take a stand, not in an antagonistic way, but we have to take a stand in a theology that is rooted. And for us in particular, we are Armenian, we are Wesleyan, and we believe in the choice of free will. We believe in that. But we also believe in salvation through Jesus Christ. You know, John Wesley's sermons, let's just cut to the chase here. John Wesley's sermons were eloquently written. Granted. But almost every single John Wesley sermon said, look, your choice... Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior or you can go to the place you don't want to go. Your choice, though. We don't want to say that today. We think we've out-educated or we've out... that, that those thoughts are antiquated and we don't want to have anything involving accountability. And frankly, there is an accountability. This pastor happens to believe in the kingdom of heaven. I also believe in a hell. I believe in a right and I believe in a wrong. I believe in a just. I believe in an unjust. And maybe some of the things that someone might consider unjust, we let go. If someone pulls up to get food here and they're in a Rolls Royce, I am no position to judge them because of the car they drive. And I'll tell you why. That Rolls Royce could have been given to them or that Rolls Royce may be about to be repossessed. You never know. We're not here to judge people and we're not here to judge anything but whether truth is truth. Or falsehood is falsehood. For those of you trying to raise kids, you know trying to navigate in this world. Sit them down in front of a news broadcast and see what you get. Local or national. Trying to find the truth today can be very, very difficult. And this book is your constitution and my constitution. It's what keeps us grounded and what keeps us rooted. You know, we're about to start a sermon series on the Ten Commandments and living out the commandments. And you know, it may step on a few toes. But if we're not willing to step into the truth and live into that truth Paul's talking about at the church at Colossae, why are we here? 
And the answer is we're here to go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ. Paul wants the church to thrive. And what he's essentially giving is instructions under the challenges that they have in order for them to thrive. Our mission is Matthew 28, to go out and make disciples. The last words that Jesus spoke before he ascended into heaven. And in that, there is a truth in how we act in and out of a worship environment or a church environment, or a school environment, or a sporting environment, or a civic club environment, or a city government environment. People are watching. Paul says, teach truth. Do you realize you're teaching all the time when people know you're a Christian? You're teaching them what is real, what is just, and what is unjust. It's a lot of pressure, I understand. But no one said that walking the faith was an easy task. See, there is one way through Jesus Christ, your Savior. That is the way of salvation that John Wesley spoke of and Paul constantly spoke of. The other night I was teaching Bible study and I tried something, an experiment with the kids that had come out after children's programming. By the way, just a plug, but we have Bible studies on Wednesday evening and they're at 6.30 in the parking lot. They last for uh, 30 minutes and then you head home. And they're on 89 or 88.9, I believe, at this point. If we need to change the channel, we will. But people are coming, and we're having some interaction. And it's an exciting time. And we also have live worship here at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. And then we have live worship in the parking lot before that at 9.30 a.m. Now, I say that because I want you to know that you're more than welcome to come. And I say 9.30, excuse me, it's 9. You're more than welcome to come and show up. But even if you're at home, I want you to take these lessons and consider, even if you're in a sequestered environment, how can you be a witness for the truth in Jesus Christ as your Savior? What can you do? Can you make a phone call to someone? Can you write someone a card of encouragement? Send them a text. Something to let them know that they need to be reminded and you want to be the one to remind them that Jesus loves them as their Savior. Paul is excited about the church at Colossae, but he says, hey, don't let the false teachers get to you. Don't let them be disruptive. Be who you are and stand in the truth. The faith in which you receive, therefore, in fact, he uses that. That's Greek logic. There's the and if and the therefore in Greek logic, and Paul begins this letter with specifically that. Think about the nature of the pastor. He was a great guy compared to his brother Richard over here. He actually kind of spoke a truth, didn't he? It's a joke, but it does have certain implications that call us to task. And it's a healthy task, and it's a positive task. There used to be a song that came out in the 60s called Teach Your Children Well. Look that up on YouTube. Pretty good lyrics. But folks, this takes work, and I know it takes work. And I know right now, you're living in a world that none of us predicted. But you know, in truth, before COVID came along, wasn't it a world that none of us could predict? Didn't we have occurrences that, that happened and we said, this is, this is horrible. I don't know how to deal with this. What's just happened? But folks, we have a chance to witness and be the church of Jesus Christ in and out of this edifice. And my prayer for you this week is that you seek the just and the good that you seek God's what we call deontological nature in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as Paul talked about the progression, or John Wesley talked about the journey to perfection in itself. And I pray that you know you're on that journey and Jesus Christ lives within your heart and your soul and your mind and wants only good for you and wants good for those around you that you can teach. Folks, read this scripture at home. Pray over it. What is the false teaching that's surrounding you? What is the false teaching that you need to push aside? What are priorities in society that are outweighing the truth in Jesus Christ? And I pray that you can identify those and turn them over to God and say, Lord, help me. Guide me back into your will and wherever I have strayed. And know that God is with you and that he loves you.
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of God's church said together, Amen. We give the invitation that is threefold. If you'd like to accept Christ as your Savior, you'd like to be baptized, or if you'd like to join with this congregation, I promise you, you won't find a better group of people who are sinners just trying to get it right. Please know that we would welcome an email or a text or a call to the church office. Anything that could signify that you'd like to do so, we would celebrate that in whatever venue, however and wherever we needed to with you. But the invitation is always open to you. time for tithes and offerings. If you're involved in push pay or automatic debit or you'd like to send a check to the church, we have plenty of outreach going on right now. The church ministries are continuing and in fact uh, children's ministry is back up and running and so is Bible study and so are many other things going on. 
So please know that your tithes and offerings will be utilized with incredibly wise stewardship. And now go in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you let us be full. You let us be empty. You let us have all things. You let us have nothing. Lord, may we be brought high for you or low for you, put to work or set aside for you. Lord, let us have all things, even let us have nothing. We give ourselves to you, Lord. May we serve with your goodness. May we be the hands and feet of Christ to the world. And I ask that we go out in faith and be just that. In the name of the risen Christ Jesus, go in peace. Amen.